Please support my daddy's show by donating a couple bucks to patreon.com forward slash Rev Left Radio. Please follow us on Twitter at Rev Left Radio. And don't forget to rate and review the revolutionary Left Radio on iTunes to increase our reach. Workers, Workers of, of the world, world unite! unite! We're educated, we've been given a certain set of tools, but then we're thrown right back into the working class. Well, good luck with that because more and more of us are waking the fuck up. So we have a tendency to what we have, we have earned, right? And what we don't have, we are going to earn. We uh, unintentionally, I think, oftentimes kind of frame our lives uh, as though we are, you know, the, the predestined. People want to be guilt-free, like, I didn't do it, like, this is not my fault. And I think that's part of the distancing from, like, people who don't want to admit that there's privilege. When the main function of a protect and serve supposedly group is actually revenue generation, they, they don't protect and serve. It's simply illogical to say that the things that affect all of us, that can result in us losing our house, that can result in us not having clean drinking water, why should those be in anybody else's hands? They should be in the people's hands who are affected by those institutions. People are engaged in to, to overcome oppression, to fight back, and to identify those systems and structures that are oppressing them. God, those communists are amazing. Welcome to Revolutionary Left Radio. I am your host and comrade, Brett O'Shea, and today I have a very special guest, Dr. Layla Abdel Rahim. Um, Layla, would you like to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your background? Um, all right. I usually have difficulty introducing myself because, um, um, well, you know, I happen to be a human being <laughs> um, from the species of uh, unwise apes <laughs> <laughs> and um, who happens to be very interested and dedicated in um, questions of um, uh, sustainable life uh, for all species on earth um, and for questions of uh, self-realization of ev every individual and every person and so um, this, of course, uh, led me to my work in uh, a variety of disciplines. Uh, and so um, anthropology, um, I borrow a lot from biology, from economics, uh, in order to understand how, uh, what are the principles of life and uh, how do different uh, social, economic and cultural choices impact um, our uh, community of life uh, and communities in general. That's awesome. And I'm, I'm super excited to have you on. You were actually recommended to us um, by a listener who really wanted to, you know, for us to give you a platform to come on and, and kind of give us your, you know, your theory and your worldview. So I'm very honored to have you on. This episode is going to be centered around um, the politics of, of anarcho-primitivism and anti-civilizational politics. And so if you're ready, we can just go ahead and dive right in with the first set of questions. Perfect. All right. So let's start off with what is anarcho-primitivism and how does it differ from other more orthodox variants of anarchism? All right. So um, anarcho-primitivism um, is, um, um, I, w I wouldn't say it's a framework, but let's say uh, it's a methodology and a perspective on um, the available data, let's say, on life, like what makes life possible, what makes life feasible on our planet, um, and where does the suffering um, come from. So it's basically um, all aspects of, um, um, of forces or groups that have historically fought against oppression, against uh, um, civilization against different uh, forms of organ of human self-organization that imposes war, violence, um, and uh, dispossession. Um, they have always uh, been interested, ob obviously, then in questions of uh, liberty, and you know they would frame them differently: egalitarianism or justice, and and so you have like a variety of. Uh, of movements through history that would 
address or focus on one of these or several aspects of oppression. Uh, Narco-primitivism, in this sense, uh, kind of zooms out. Um, so if most of those movements, um, all shades of anarchism, uh, socialism, communism, anti-colonialism, uh, have focused on oppression from anthropocentric uh, lens, uh, they have inadvertently then fallen into the very econ economic machine that ensures the proliferation of civilization and then its expansion. So anarcho-primitivism zooms out from this uh, human selfishness, uh, egotism, and anthropocentrism to look at, okay, if then life existed on Earth for billions of years, what were the principles? And then by virtue of such um, an analysis or zoom out, you start, uh, you lose your uh, high ground or your kind of position of supremacy. Because then you realize that, well, life knew how to proliferate and how to balance itself through principles that governed um, kind of equal and free anarchist uh, access to energy, to space. Um, the sense of time would be then intertwined with that proliferation of diversity in life. Um, the sense of space would be intertwined with that coexistence. And so then there's no place for the human ape as at the top of a pyramid that has then designated itself as having the right to consume and to hunt and to kill and to possess eventually. Um, so then you see that place and you look at, at what governs um, those uh, those societies, and that's mutualism. And our place in this then falls um, into how we can contribute to the proliferation of diversity in life. And so eventually then um, using this set of tools for analysis, which is observations from nature or wilderness, um, observation of historical uh, cultures and cultural choices and communities, um, human and non-human, uh, then you realize that um, anarchism can work only if we see that ultimate supremacy. Okay, yeah, I, I totally see that. Um, one way that I'm, I'm still learning about it, but one way that I conceptualize anarcho-primitivism is... Um, this this distinction between you know more orthodox forms of leftism, you know they root their critique in capitalism as sort of the the basis um, of so many social ills that you know are promoted through the economic paradigm of capitalism. Um, Anarcho primitivists, in my understanding at least, would say capitalism itself is a manifestation of yet a further deeper ill, and that ill is civilization. Would you agree with that with that framing? Exactly. Okay, so, so in that context, then, how would you exactly define civilization? And maybe you can touch on the agricultural revolution here. And uh, so, like, when did civilization start? And what is, like, fundamentally wrong with civilization? Okay, so, um, well, civilization, um, that's like your general, well, for me, at least, it was my fifth grade history textbook, um, uh, you know, where I first learned about the Hindu Valley and the Fertile Crescent um, in Mesopotamia, so that's uh, present-day Iraq, Syria, and um, the Middle East. Um, so civilization began basically um, as um, a kind of, okay, so it, in my words, civilization actually is the byproduct of a certain cultural and socio-economic, socio-environmental decision of certain humans to domesticate um, 
non-humans, and then eventually it led to human to domesticating humans as well, uh, sedentary and labor-oriented um, uh, predatory uh, organ social organization. So what does that mean then? Um, it means that the material kind of effects uh, of civilization, which manifest themselves into, um, well, growth of domesticated humans and non-human populations for the purpose of using them as either labor or non-humans using them for food um, and for different things. Um, crops, you domesticate crops, uh, you force them also to reproduce more of what you want and exterminate everything else that poses a threat. So you see that settlements start growing and uh, cities start growing. And with that came obviously, um, well, uh, diseases, um, hierarchy, starvation, the health of uh, humans and non-humans suffered. Uh, longevity obviously then suffers, um, quality of life, happiness, and uh, um, the joy of life in, um, in its diverse and unpredictable but yet harmonious um, wild coexistence then um, seeds to this hierarchical exploitative system of where the domesticator owns uh, the lives, the time, the effort, and the flesh of what then it conceives as its rightful resources. Okay, so for me, this is where I differ from other critiques in anarcho-primitivism, is that civilization is not the root of all evil. Civilization is a response to the human revolution in its anthropology, in its self-perception, social construction of itself as the supreme predator. Mm. So predation then, and then you see um, that lang uh, language, the birth of speech, human language, and um, art, representational art in the caves, coincides with the humans taking that step towards hunting, killing, and kind of um, vac vacating that previous uh, spot in, um, in the diversity of life, what I call social contract, where the human primates were disseminators of seeds um, to carnivorous killers. And the first uh, technology towards civilization can be found then in that language and in the depiction that of animals that they would kill that allowed the human predator to alienate herself, himself, because gender starts um, from there, mm. um, himself, that he would kill and then those who give birth to the human resources settle and domesticate and the, the plants in order to have that surplus to feed the hunter, to sustain the hunter during that hunt. And so settlement and domestication is a response to that decision. So not only is it this sort of physical separation from from the natural way human beings have lived for so long but it's also representative of this sort of psychological split where the human being starts to conceive of itself almost as as an as an abstract concept and and that sort of psychological break from nature um, sort of perpetuates this this confrontational attitude towards nature, this predatory attitude where nature must be confronted and where it can be preyed upon, it should be preyed upon, and where it can be beaten into submission, it should be beaten into submission. Um, is is that a is that a proper way of kind of understanding what you're saying here about that that fundamental change in, in the human mind? Absolutely, yeah. 
So then from there, we see, as you said, the rise of hierarchies, the rise of what eventually would turn into kings and queens and monarchies and feudalism, which then again turned into capitalism. So what role does a critique of capitalism play in the broader critique of civilization? Absolutely. And um, so the, the different critiques in themselves are actually very useful because you look at, for example, um, critiques of um, epistemic racism, critiques of slave, slavery-based economics, slavery and race-based economics, which is connected to epistemic critique of racism, um, critiques, feminist critiques um, of economic and political um, kind of capitalization of um, of social power and social wealth. Um, you see queer theory um, offering uh, serious challenges to how under this whole capitalist system um, gender then gets conceived, used, and constructed. All of these critiques are important. The problem is that uh, where they fail is that if you focus only on that little department without zooming out to connect them together to yet zoom out and to see how in the end without this critique of human predation, you will end up reconfirming that very system um, that keeps evolving and finding the, the finding new ways of um, using and abusing uh, symbolic uh, capital, you know, uh, social capital, uh, labor resources, you know, land extraction economies and uh, and everything until finally um, it will devour like the globe, the whole, you know, now uh, life, the future of life is in crisis. Um, and so the, this is the problem with, um, uh, with people who adhere to one school or another and then they start fighting among themselves. So uh, without looking at how the hierarchy places us in a way that we shall always keep using the resources in this hierarchy, in this food chain. Uh, we will predate on those weaker than us, and we will feed those who are stronger than us. In what ways would a, a if it was even, po or maybe it is, who knows, but maybe it's going to happen regardless, but what would a sort of anarcho-primitivist ideal society look like? Is, is there any going back? Is, is the psychological split uh, that gave rise to civilization and thus capitalism, is there any way that we could rationally or, or sort of like um, responsibly gear down? Or is, is it just going to have to end in some sort of catastrophe because the momentum of thousands of years of civilization is so strong? that there's no way to, to, you know, kind of shift gears and get out of that mentality? Um, well, um, that's another kind of myth that is usually attributed to anarcho-primitivists, is that, well, you want to take us back to the cave. Well, you know, as much as I <laughs> would have loved to live in a cave, and actually I really enjoyed the caves, the Neanderthal caves in, in the Crimea, mm. we visited there in 2006, um, well, the result of civilization is this unsustainable human population growth. Okay, so there's no way you can have uh, seven billion and marching on people move into caves. Um, so obviously we cannot go back um, to a sustainable number of humans as we were, say, you know, 300,000 years ago or even 10,000 years ago, or even beginning of the 20th century. Um, so that's not what anarcho-primitivists 
are saying you go back you go forward with what you have and the way to go forward is not to hide your head in the sand and pretend that these painful questions um, are just don't exist because they're uncomfortable um, we have to address them and to see that first of all the fir the first question is that the way it's going on it's unsustainable for first of all other species and without other species we are doomed so it's just like in the end the collapse is going to affect everyone and unfortunately us in the very end because those are higher up the human hierarchy uh, will find ways to extend their existence as long as possible but it's just impossible to survive in a, on an on a planet that won't have fresh water and oxygen. Okay, so unless they somehow figure out how to change that, you know, base of, of human life on this planet, uh, which is science fiction, and it's, it just won't happen. Right. Okay, so where do we go from facing the facts as they are? And facing the facts that 7 billion and marching on is not sustainable, but obviously, we're not going to then say a la Maltus, well, you know, um, too bad, you know, those who can't afford to survive die off. Obviously not. Okay, so then we're going to um, start rewilding our own relationships within our hierarchy to include non-humans in a way that then will naturally control our propensity to proliferate under domestication. The birth of human population was triggered because it was a requirement of domesticated humans and non-humans um, to produce resources. Okay, and you see that um, for example, you compare domesticated dogs and wild wolves. How many pups the wild wolves have, and they and they um, have those pups within specific seasons. Um, they keep their their population growth at z at zero, and so that's why they get threatened by human expansion. Because then you know if if you don't proliferate. Um, the more you are killed, the less there will be. Mm -hmm. Most um, so-called predators um, in the wild um, reproduce very rarely. And so, but the humans, when they took th that decision to become predators, actually switched their reproductive clock and started demanding you know, by mimetic means, um, more and more hum human resources. You know, those who would go to, to farm, those who would um, protect and defend, you know, so the military, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then the step to realizing how the economy of wilderness works and rewilding our own relationships with our domesticators and our propensity to reproduce will curb and will start seeding um, those deserts that were created by human civilizations um, to inviting a more diversity of life and sharing. And by inviting that diversity of life, instead of, for example, controlling all the crops, uh, you plant apple trees and then you're the owner and you have the farmers or the peasants who work for you and those who guard and those who, who, who sell them. Um, and, and instead of uh, using that monocultural hierarchical system of extraction, if you allow a diversity of plants in that land, if you see that ownership, of the human labor and the crops that the 
say, apple orchards yield, you will find that there will be more life, a more variety of crops, and there will be less need to have humans who will be then exploited and, um, you know, either in wars or in, in other. Um, so the path to the future uh, depends on how willing are we to really live. And if we want to live, then we have to learn how to let life proliferate and live in joy and its diversity. Absolutely. So right here is a pivotal point in our conversation because I think so many leftists, so many anarchists or Marxists or what have you, have a view of anarcho-primitivism as a fundamentally regressive one that, as you correctly said, well, they think that it means a going back to a hunter-gatherer sort of environment of, of you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. So, so many of the critiques of anarcho-primitivism come from this characterization of it as just tear down the hospitals, tear down, you know, the drug companies, tear down the roads and infrastructure, just destroy civilization and let's just go back to live in caves. But what you are saying is that is fundamentally false. And the truth of the situation is that there is no going back. All we can do is go forward. And the way to go forward is to understand this critique, internalize it, and then begin the process of what you refer to as rewilding. Is that fair? And if so, can you go on to define what rewilding means on a personal or maybe societal level? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, that, that is exactly um, so. And um, I guess the critique comes from a misunderstanding of um, anarcho-primitivist and um, John Zerzan's um, warning which was taken out of context. So he warned that, in, in his analysis, that civilization is unsustainable. Civilization is cruel, and civilization will ultimately lead to economic, social, ecological collapse. So um, that was taken out of context, and then the reaction was, oh, so you are waiting for collapse. Um, and that is not what the critique entails. The critique entails that, okay, you want that collapse in order to start re-envisioning on its ashes a new future, but the analysis shows that that future cannot exist on a dead planet. Mm. Okay, so then how do we um, take into our hands um, the, the rewilding, okay, or, ma or making life uh, viable. And this is uh, where my critique of um, all, the civil uh, all the revolutions that took place so far in an attempt to, um, well, first, you know, the, we know the French, the, the British revolutions, the American revolutions, the Russian, the Chinese, all the wars um, against uh, colonialism and revolution after revolution in Africa and Asia and Latin America, um, have ultimately failed precisely because the epistemic foundation of human supremacy was never addressed. And so the, the revolution, the predatory revolution, the original revolution that kind of ruptured us from this community of life and diversity of life and the joy of life was a revolution, an epistemic, anthropological revolution in self-conception. And so we have, in order to really succeed this time, we have to again understand what is at stake in the ways in which we envisage ourselves, envisage our roles in the society. 
so for example we can start by okay what is society okay if it's a, if you consider that society is the humans with whom you have economic networks these are very um, alienating um, highly segregated economies and groups and networks uh, that kind of um, if if you could feel you can thrive in that network then it's because you have a lot to exploit below you um, so how are you going to envisage yourself outside of that network is it a specific gender with whom you mostly interact and with whom you have the most important economic exchanges what is the hidden economy behind that what you do not want to acknowledge you have access to what makes that materialize okay once we start um, understanding the effort the economic input and output and extraction and consumption that is behind everything that we take for granted this is where the epistemic revolution will take place because then you will understand that how predatory it is and you will understand how to invite a diversity of beings from other classes human social classes and for me social class is can be organized by gender by race you know all of these um, epistemic classifications have a value in this economy now this is where marxist analysis is really useful and helpful mm. uh, because then you can understand how we are alienated from both what we extract and what we produce mm -hmm. and once we start facing that and understanding the whole economic mesh in which everything exists and inviting others from other species other classes human and non-human this is where the rewilding begins what do you give back to that wild community that you allow to exist for its own purpose to simply enjoy life not for your pleasure not for your profit then we start to rewild ourselves and we will find that actually the quality of our experience on this earth will immediately rise we'll have like we will be less stressed we'll, because we'll be less predatory and being less predatory we will not expect a predator to constantly loom over our shoulder because the ultimate predator is us mm. consuming each other yeah that's really interesting the notion of of looking over your shoulder for a predator and these sort of boogeymen that we construct in our minds is almost uh a natural outgrowth of that sort of paranoia of being a predator. Um, and what you're talking about when you speak of rewilding and the epistemic revolution, um, I find that fascinating. And I really think that leftists of all stripes need to really be honest and listen to what, what you are saying, Layla, because you are taking this tendency of anarcho-primitivism and really giving it a wonderful defense and you're knocking down so many caricatures that are pushed up against it, as you mentioned earlier. But when you talk about the epistemic revolution, I've heard the term civilized and wild narratives be brought up in your in your writing and your talking. So what is the difference between civilized and wild narratives? And, and what role does that play in the sort of epistemic revolution that you were talking about? Oh, yes, absolutely. And that's actually uh, part of the title of my second book, uh, that came out with Rutledge in 2015. Um, so um, it, the the first part of the title is Chil Children's Literature, Domestication and Social Foundation, Narratives of Civilization and Wilderness. And um, that was based on my uh, doctoral dissertation in which I looked at the ways in which these fundamental premises of civilization and wilderness then play out in narratives that we think um, are fiction or science 
or holy texts and even revolutionary children's books. And so um, when we do not understand uh, what is in those principles, then it's easy to take um, in, in this book. I use, for example, an example of, um, say, uh, Anne of Green Gables or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, with, which apparently to many at first sight may might appear to be well, a feminist or um, kind of anti-proletarian, poverty-stricken kind of uh, revolutionary text, okay? Yeah. It's, it's difficult to imagine that some people actually think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in those terms, but <laughs> apparently many do. <laughs> okay, so again, here, if we understand um, well, or analyze the underlying premises of civilization, as um, the, those, the, first of all, monocultural, um, hierarchical, that naturalize killing, okay? So it's based on hunting, right? Um, on domesticating of animals for human uh, use, on rape, because if you force crops to reproduce what they would not have chosen, through their intricate and intimate community of pollinators and disseminators, then that is rape. And we don't think in those terms of crops, but, but this is what we do. Um, we don't think of the, in those terms of the turkeys that we have modified in such horrendous ways that they can't even reproduce themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to force, inseminate them. Okay, that's rape. And then you look, if, 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 if this is the principle of civilization, then there is no way that any civilized text, no matter how revolutionary it might claim to be, that will ever challenge that very economic basis. And so look at, and then evolutionary theory, you know, scientific um, interpretation of facts will then be tainted by these norms that we take for granted as we don't even see them. Scientists then become biased because they accept, they don't they accept, they, you know, they don't see this as a problem. And so they will end up, no matter how much they sincerely may want to topple, you know, oppressive economics, they will keep reconfirming the same structure. Mm. Okay, and so it's very linear because it always goes towards a certain goal. Um, extractionist, that means violence, rape, racism, all that, forced reproduction is part of that narrative towards who will then gain access. And so Charlie and the Cho Chocolate Factory shows that, okay, if there's one boy who wins the lottery, will become, will inherit this hierarchy with the Oompa Loompas, those poor creatures brought in crates from obviously Africa, because where else does cocoa grow? Um, and we'll work for you and dance and, um, you know, and all of you will live happily ever after in exactly the same violent structure. Okay. So then if language uh, is, a gra is the grammar, the technology that helps to, um, this system to self-propagate, then my question was, can we, stemming from the fact that we are, say, diseased by civilization, occupied, civilized, domesticated by this predatory, kind of almost alien within ourselves that makes us act against ourselves? Is it possible? 
And it is possible. I found there are some texts. So in, um, in this book, um, I use the example of, um, um, well, I, different um, indigenous stories, uh, some stories from north of Russia, um, where I was born. <laughs> And um, and even in a civilized setting, Tuvi Janssen wrote the Moomin Trolls in Finland in, um, during World War II. She started during World War II and she went on until the 70s, like those nine books on the Moomin Trolls. And I found that the premises of these books are wild, just like the premises in those stories told by indigenous people uh, in the north of Russia. And they could be indigenous, they could be ethnically Russian, or there are different you know, nationalities and ethnic groups in Russia as well. So it doesn't matter. What makes them wild is that the human, first of all, there's no grammar to situate the human as, um, as the highest rightful predator or owner uh, of every good outcome in an economic transaction. Um, there is no linear um, kind of movement in logic towards that human winning over other forces, animal or non-human. Um, there is no grammar um, that expects the protagonist to beat something and then emerge victorious against something else. It is just, um, the movement trolls is amazing because it's like different kind of no moral of the story experiences of little movement troll going through life in a diversity of life with dangers looming out there because obviously there could be danger but in the end, if you know how to tune into that harmony of diversity, that your family is never static and monospeciesist or monoclassist, then everything will be fine. And the most important part is that you can never take a, gram a grammatical rule extracted from whatever happened in that story and apply it next time. So it kind of follows this, um, that if it's chaos that's moving through the universe and we all are particles that kind of dance and tune to each other, but every time it's something new and every time it works out because you were intelligent and wise and wild to have figured out how to move with that community. Mm. Would you say that there is a role to play for people that are sympathetic to anarcho-primitivist ideas or the ideas that you're expounding today? There's a role for artists and filmmakers and, and authors and novelists to take into their own hands the duty of rewilding the mind by putting into their work these wild narratives? Would you say that that is one way that people who are sympathetic to these ideas can operate in the real world and start to sort of change the minds of other people? Could be one way. Um, ultimately, um, the, the ultimate um, may be uh, optimal uh, thing would be for everyone, because um, this is uh, um, what narratives of wilderness tell us, is that if there's no moral of the story, uh, there's no rule for protagonists to emerge as protagonists, as heroes, then everyone, in whatever moment of time and space, experiences some communication with others regardless of their species or class, again, regardless of language. Like, you go to a forest and you will experience an encounter with trees, with bugs, with, uh, with animals. Um, 
they are protagonists and you are protagonists in that moment. And this is your story and you can share it with others. But ultimately, it's what you live and how you end up not being a voyeur or kind of um, the, the, the supreme user of that space. But you tune into the economy and you see, you look into that, what you bring to that economy is exactly what you take. Then you become a protagonist. And then art and stories themselves start becoming really relevant and, and wild and ever evolving. Mm. I, in my personal life, um, I find that when I'm stressed out, when I'm struggling with depression or anxiety, one of the main things I do is I go into nature. I set my life aside, even if it's just for a few hours, and walk around alone in the woods. And it's almost an experiment um, if you would you like to use that term to test these ideas, because I find that when I immerse myself in nature, when I, when I let my thinking and my internal dialogue slow down and I feel myself as an awareness inside of the, you know, beauty and, and depth of nature, that is, it actually has a profoundly healing effect on my psyche and on my psychology. So do you think that by rewilding, um, you should try to, as much as possible, interact with nature, embed yourself in it, and just sort of let it consume you for a while as a way of sort of breaking down, you know, civilized narratives or however you want to frame it? Absolutely. And uh, the, the critical word here, I, I love the way you phrased it, is to embed yourself, which means that you become responsible, bound to a social contract, a pact that we have with life, that what do you then, if, if you felt that emotional healing, did you bring emotional and other healing to that community? So then it becomes much more powerful. Uh, it, it doesn't, um, it, it stops being consumerist because um, what a lot of um, now, uh, even, you know, school programs realize that, well, you know, kids uh, suffer from depression. I saw a few uh, articles in The Guardian and other places. Well, you know, if kids, uh, poor kids uh, um, in downtown, say, Los Angeles, don't have access to the ocean. And so you take them on a the bus to the ocean for the first time. And then you kind of feel good about yourself because, you know, you took them on that bus, they ran around, and then you take them back. Or there was another project, well, you take them and they clean the ocean. And it's like, excuse me, none of these are solutions for permanent healing of these kids and them being stuck in situations where it becomes only like according to your generosity that you could take a bus to take them and clean their whole lives they will be most probably if they're in the ghetto they will be serving you and cleaning so there's mm -hmm. there's nothing uh fundamentally new to the capitalist and civilized economy that devastates human and non-human populations. So embedding, I like the way you put it, embedding yourself in that community is having, giving people access to a spot that they will rewild and open up to the growth of plant diversity, food diversity for non-human and human alike. And you see such attempts. Uh, I know some uh, a Deep Green Philly uh, is involved um, in attempting to rewild, you know, Philadelphia um, in a more meaningful way. How do you? And of course, uh, there will be a lot of um, resistance because the minute it will start um, threatening 
the capitalization of space and gentrification and uh, you know different new ways of recuperating of different spaces and human and non-human resources uh, for this hierarchy of course uh, will have resistance but you see these attempts throughout the world like total liberation groups in Europe um, reach out to Tunisia to Turkey to Georgia um, in order to make meaningful total liberation spaces for humans and non-humans precisely in ways that will embed more and more people into these wild economics where you will start being accountable before yourself and before that community of diversity. Yeah, I mean, w w once you start feeling it, so once you have those uh, experiences in nature, there is this sort of internal um, pull or, you know, you're compelled to go back because it, it is so intrinsically rewarding. And so this notion of trying to have organizations that rewild certain areas or, you know, create little spots for children to go to, um, non-coerced, not in the context of cleaning up for the system and all of that, which I think were great critiques. Um, but I, I love I love that idea, and I think it's important. Um, sort of some of this revolves, and you mentioned John Zerzan earlier. Um, specifically, um, you talked about um, the use of language with relation to narratives. What is uh, John Zerzan's critique of language and symbolic culture specifically? Because I think that really touches on on what we're discussing here in a deeper way. Um, absolutely. So, um, so uh, John Zerzan basically um, observed that. Um, that language um, and symbolic thought and symbolic representation allowed us to kind of uh, this degree of separation from that which you are then going to um, use or consume. And in Anthropological research, you can find uh, in my book, uh, especially this, the second, the Rutledge book, um, I list like a, a whole bunch of um, anthropologists, um, say uh, Jack Goody, um, Walter Ong, among others, who observed that actually literacy emerged with agricultural uh, civilization with hierarchy and literacy. The first texts were not poetry or even religious texts. The first texts were actually lists of who owes whom. And that kind of solidified. So literacy then was a further step in the developing of that technology mm. of alienation that John Zerzer observed um, that even before literacy that started with hunting, um, solidified and made permanent those relationships of debt, that you no longer are bound to the community of life, where if you take something, for example, um, if we are primates and we eat, and we're on the, on, on the trees, um, say, in Central American, we eat avocados, uh, and we take and throw away the pulp of the avocado, uh, well, we eat uh, the seed of the avocado, and then the avocado grows. And this is how we agree together with the avocado that it gives us some flesh, and we help it spread the seed, whilst birds and and butterflies help pollinate and cross-pollinate and spread um, a variety of, of possibilities uh, of offspring. Okay, so we, we kind of rupture from that and we take a step away from this and we suddenly change our self-conception, and we become, um, at a certain point, scavengers, and then suddenly decide, okay, we are no longer going to heed that pact, that contract, we are going to hunt, and 
what is going to help us through generation maintain this decision is something that then becomes kind of um, almost like a mimetic or genetic imperative that then solidifies in the texts and the stories and those lists of who owes whom. And it's no longer that we owe the berries or the avocados. It becomes we owe those who domesticate us mm. in order to consume and help spread that hierarchy and desertification. So, um, so literacy um, also plays, um, uh, because what I say, um, again, uh, scientific uh, literature, well, starting with, uh, say, Peter Kropotkin's uh, theory of evolu evolution through mutualism, um, well, his book, Mutual Aid, a Factor uh, in Evolution, uh, where he observes that mutualism is guarded, or mutualistic economies in the wild are guarded by um, empathy. So if you feel the suffering of the other, regardless of whether that other is a human being or non-human being, most animals then respond, even predators respond to other species, children, cries, okay? So it's almost like they have, and they heed that pact they have with life, that we're going to consume the old, but you will have uh, a young lioness, you know, risking her own life and starving, protecting a baby deer or a baby gazelle. Okay, so symbolic thought, by representing a relationship as something not other, allows us to withdraw and not to feel what we would have instinctually felt. So it kind of then superimposes itself on reality that when we are domesticated, we start looking at reality through specific narratives. We don't understand that reality is what it is. And this is what we see in a lot of the clashes. Um, you would have um, very decent uh, white supremacists uh, <laughs> talk... <laughs> yeah, that's an oxymoron <laughs> uh, well in, you know in, in their lives in, in, in their milieu they're very decent honorable human beings um, you know really sincerely arguing that their vision and, and maybe they sincerely believe sometimes you know well when reality comes to you know testing okay we'll is it because you did not know that, say, um, a race that has been exploited by your forefathers still suffers? Um, would you give up, you know, some of your goods? Um, some would and some wouldn't. But let's say, like, some of them don't know. The narrative allows them to actually honestly not feel and not know and be close to that experience. Mm. If you take away that narrative, and a lot of them, if they felt that suffering, and they realized that, okay, I can do something not to hear those screams of pain, they would do it. They would go and rewild themselves. So the narratives then help keep the status quo, even in cases where there would have been a sincere disruption, well, desire to disrupt that economy. And it solidifies that economy and keeps transmitting. And this is where I, uh, my analysis of the text and the, lit the literature and the scientific texts, and some of them, you know, like I said, uh, claim to be revolutionary. Uh, the film Up, same thing. Well, you know, two poor people and there's like civilization growing around. And I, I discuss that in my book. Um, and um, Ellie, like, they, they work all their lives, and she she's the one who dreams to go to the mountaintop in South America. And um, finally, it's like a heroic feat. Well, she dies, and so her husband is old, and he takes off in the balloons. And you will see that the narrative then 
sneaks into and nor uh, normalizes, naturalizes the fact that if the woman is dead, it's enough to have her picture go on to the top of the mountain. It's as if as good as you know should have made it. It's, they right. actually claim it to be a feminist narrative, and um, it's symbolic. It's very symbolic. Well, just the photograph, but then. If you look at the reality of that economic culture, what happened to her? She was consumed and she died old and frail who had forgotten and abandoned her dream. Mm. And you look at how the white man who goes to live Ellie's dream enters the space of so-called South America and Nothing exists in South America except for him and that symbolic dream. Mm. And so if you don't have that text, if you go to South America and you experience what, if you go to the forest and you see what the petroleum companies are doing, you will not want to participate in that economy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is maybe getting a little off the rails here, but everything that you're saying is leading my mind to this thought because it's something that I've done in my own life. And when I talk about going out into the forest, this is an activity that I partake in. And that activity is meditation. When you're talking about symbolic culture, when you're talking about language, um, what we're talking about in some respect, or at least it leads back to this idea of talking to ourselves in our heads all day. And that is a, a veil of thought that disconnects us from the world around us and the people around us. And in my personal experience, I have found that when I am keeping up a consistent and deep meditation practice, my empathy explodes. My, my, my care for other people, my care for the world around me, the boundaries between me and everything else start to get loose and start to dissolve. And I find, I don't know if, if you have any experience with this, but what are your thoughts on meditation and the notion of that as a tool to sort of deprogram your mind from this symbolic culture? Um, well, I totally agree with the way you interpret it, um, where the danger, and that's the danger of language, is that then, you know, a, a term like this will be taken and say, um, a new age economy and taking to mean that, well, meditation is you and yourself and you are so important and love yourself and <laughs> right. it's completely, you know, pay me money. I'll teach you how to love <laughs> yourself. <laughs> so um, it's totally taken out of the original context of where as you point out, that meditation is actually uh, where you become one with the cosmos. Mm. When you become one with everything around you here and beyond and the stars, where you feel that depth of connection because in the end we are made of the same substance as this earth and as the stars. And so it's opening up to that empathy. And it's not closing into how good you want to feel and the world is burning. And so, yes, um, absolutely. Um, I, um, I would maybe, well, may maybe meditation would be the best term to describe it in this sense, but it's really um, going out into the forest and experiencing it not like what you said, not with that cognitive um, stuck in language, you know, obsessive, compulsive, like, you know, rerunning this and that, um, but really turning off of that civilized linguistic existence to understanding what happens within you and without you um, on this multi-level wild intelligence um, that 
we are yet to kind of retrieve because we had that and we can have that if we stop uh, being in, enmeshed in this domesticating uh, linguistic existence. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right when you talk about the way meditation or the, the culture, you know, the, the East Asian culture of Buddhism and meditation has been co-opted by the capitalist corporate state and their practices. So now you'll see these huge Fortune 500 companies having meditation time with their workers where they all come together and they sit in a room and they meditate. And that, that increases productivity. I mean, that, <laughs> that makes me want to vomit just, just saying those words. Exactly. <laughs> but there's something much deeper there. And there's something much deeper in that culture if you, if you care to, to, to delve into it. And I would, I would even argue that by embedding yourself in nature for extended periods of time, nature itself sort of does that work. Like it starts to break down um, the conceptual apparatus because you're so disassociated from the society if you stay in nature long enough that nature will start to ease you out of, of those thought patterns and kind of embrace you you know, in, in, its, in its own existence. And you have to sort of start adapting your body and mind to the natural world around you. But yeah, I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. I, I think it does fit into some of these things that we're talking about. At least in my experience, it's 100% conducive with these, these notions of like symbolic culture and language and, and getting past that. Absolutely. Actually, I had um, experience like that um, in 2005. So we went back to Russia with my husband and my child. Um, and uh, so we were like in the north and of Tver region in the forest and the forests in Russia. Oh my goodness! You go like on the rivers, canoeing and sleeping on islands, and and you know within like you, you adapt within days, and you know you use language to the minimum. You don't scream at the kids. You don't actually like everyone kind of tunes into it. And I remember um, so I left. Uh, my child and her dad uh, with the friends there, and I had to go to a conference uh, in fi uh, through Finland in in Norway, and so it's like north of Tver region, and like okay, um, they and I I know Russia very well, okay, so I take the midnight train, I emerge from the forest, hop on this midnight train to Saint Petersburg, in order to take the train to Helsinki. And so I didn't realize I was back in civilization in the morning when I stepped, it was luckily the final station, St. Petersburg. So I stepped down off the train and that city, I did my master's research degree on, on rock music there. It's like, I have never seen this city before. I had no idea what to do with the ticket I had in hand, mm. where to step, how to ask, what to ask. And I'm like, I'm so lost. I felt like I had no idea where I was. I had no idea what, like, I'm ushered towards, you know, there's buses. What, what is a bus? It's like, it was so painful to remember that, oh, the bus will take me from, the tra from this train station to the next where I'm going to take. Oh, I have to take a train. Oh, that's what I came on train. train. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's alien. It's alien. <laughs> it's so. And then finally, I don't know how long it's like everything is slow motion, and I'm kind of forced. It was so painful to remember the vocabulary, the technology, mm. and you know, finally, I was like, okay, you know, I got back. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're well over an hour. Um, we deviated a little bit from the questions I was going to ask, but this has been a wonderful conversation. I absolutely love this. You've taught me a lot. I know you taught my listeners a lot. Um, when I framed the, when I, when I kind of advertised the fact that you were coming on to discuss anarcho-primitivism, there were so many, you know, caricatures, which even I myself have fallen prey to. And if, if people saw the sort of questions and outlines that I, I made for this episode, they would immediately see my own caricaturization of anarcho-primitivism and the errors that I made in thinking what I thought it was. But you have done all of us a service by defending the position and correcting so many of the errors. 
Um, you're an absolute delight to talk to. I really appreciate you coming on. It, it means so much to me. I'd like to have you on in the future because I find you to be totally fascinating and to be thinking in ways that just there just aren't a lot of people that are thinking in those ways. Um, but before we go, before we say thank our goodbyes, you, Brett. Yeah. I want to just say thank you, Brett. It was really wonderful to discuss with you. And yes, absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to discuss more in the future. Wonderful. Now, before we do go, though, can you please let our listeners know where they can find more of your work and maybe some recommendations for anyone who wants to learn more about anything we've discussed in this interview? Um, well, absolutely. I have um, lots of stuff on my website. Uh, so it's uh, leila.milsov.org. So L A Y L A dot M I L T S O V, milsov.org. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, links and videos and articles and uh, uh, information on my books. Uh, both books are there. You can um, order them through the publishers, the Amazon, or the library. There's libraries. Use them. Um, so uh, it's a delight to um, discuss with you, Brett, and uh, I hope this was helpful for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And I will put all that information in the summary of this episode. I'll put the link in there so people can find your work and be directed right towards you in the easiest way possible. So thank you again, Layla, for coming on. It, it's been a wonderful conversation and an honor to talk to you. And now we hear of animals and plants going extinct every day, vanishing forever. In my life, I have dreamt of seeing the great herds of wild animals, jungles and rainforests full of birds and butterflies. But now I wonder if they will yeah, even exist yeah, for my children to see. This is it, yeah. This is the end of now. This is the onslaught of war against the planet. The oncoming apocalypse. We're the enemy. It's right outside your door. We're destroying it, mile by mile. Be prepared for the onslaught of war. Yeah. This is how we're doing it, yeah. Take away all of the crap, nothing matters but the vinyl I wanna blast back to the days of a primal The pre-complicated type of guy is my idol Itemized billing for the kill and the survival We've had the red letter from the banks of nature Real bio war with the tanks and vapour Mass greed massacres, mines by the acre We master in nothing, slave away to the paper With battery hens, we tend to fake flavour So civilised, we're not friends with the neighbour Love to warmonger and falsify favours Or if I kill a singer then Innocent behaviors. We start waiting, or we pull Satan, flirting with the devil, waiting to pull Satan. Yeah, we rubbish in others at sweet pavements. Pack away the streets as I reach for the cavemen. Yeah. I am afraid to go out in the sun now because of the holes in our ozone. Like I'm afraid to breathe the air yeah. because I don't know what chemicals are in it. All this is happening before our eyes, and yet we act. Is if we have all the time we want and all the solutions. Can you believe that we've reached these peaks of forever been? Earth's not an evergreen, it's necessary men leave. King sea wash trees of the mangroves, so the mangroves grow in the peace of a stampede. My peace roam, we're no more cologne of the man they loathe, probing up no noses. Black death brings you ring a ring of roses, but when he square mile as the ring road closes. Concrete overdose, but now the fox glove blows in the foliage of old, and the rope be so breaks down, decomposing. Similar to fabric of the light. Life we've woven, yo. I kick rhyme straight from the broken lines of mine's omen. I beat the explosion. Catch criminals out moving in the open. With no hope, this is getting ghost, no joking, yeah. I am afraid to go out in the sun now because of the holes in our ozone. I am afraid to breathe the air because I don't know what chemicals are in it. All this is happening before our eyes, and yet we act. Is if we have all the time we want and all the solutions.